Yeah, uh, thank you. And yeah, thank you for being here and presenting our research at our institute. And I will just show you a bit of our research we are doing. What we actually do is like a theory modeling most time. And of course, um, well, we want to do it in a numerical more efficient way uh, more often. We use finite elements, but uh, usually we have to like do a lot to the code to make it run actually as fast as possible. So I will just show you, uh, for example, of our institute, which is everything like implemented in Ferret actually. And yeah, you see four topics. We have um, stochastic approach, we have damage modeling and you know, three and a half topics, so to speak. We have two optimizers. And actually the four people here, you see the names are sitting here in the second row. So if you have any in-depth questions, ask them. Um, I also know the topics, but well, they are doing it and also doing the code. So yeah, feel free to ask them also after the presentation. So let's start with the first topic, which is about stochastics. And of course, you probably know when you produce something, it's not deterministic. You have your Young's modulus of whatever plus minus a different uh, uh, an uncertainty base. And this can lead for such, for example, high performance um, components like the uh, blades uh, or the turbine blades. Um, to really big problem because they have to, they are under really high load, high temperature. They have to be precise to prevent leakage and energy loss. And of course, there are like yeah, reported problems when they have given uncertainty. It can like be a real big problem, like, yeah, causing casualties and so on. So the question is how to, yeah, predict this efficiently. There are like several approaches we can think about. Um, I mean, the easiest way is to do a Monte Carlo simulation, which is basically you reproduce in your final element code the stochastics. You just take the Young's modulus, have a standard deviation, and calculate it with a different Young's modulus, then do it again, and so on, and so on. So you basically do like ten thousands of simulations, and then you have your statistics. So this is physically well pretty correct and nicely, but it takes forever to basically say this. You have different methods like the perturbation, which is so simplified, you cannot be sure if it's correctly anyways. And the stochastic collocation is basically, uh, you have to have luck if it converges or not. And our approach is like, we try to make it both. So we have a physically correct model, but we are yeah, very fast, not due to like code optimization, but basically the theory itself. And the basic idea is just, um, which is actually a mathematical tr trick, we are able to split the deterministic part, which is determined by the zero and the stochastic part with this I into do, uh, two different sets of partial differential equations, which basically also yields to like, you have to do yeah, two different finite element approaches because you have two different sets of PDEs. And the first one is like the um, deterministic part is basically yeah, what you would do anyways. And the, uh, yeah, stochastic part is much more complicated with tensors higher order and so on. So I don't want to show you this here or we would stay here forever or to the next day maybe. Um, but what you do is basically for each load step, you have your basic deterministic finite element simulation plus an additional finite element simulation. And then you have basically in the post-processing step, you can calculate your expectation and um, standard deviation values. So you have like two finite elements or basically more or less the double amount of effort to do stochastics instead of like 10,000 for the Monte Carlo simulation, for example. And here's some examples with some yeah, computation times. So on the left, you have the TSM is our approach to time, uh, time separated mechanics time. Stochastic. Stochastic. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Um, which, so what we see here is the standard deviation of a stress distribution. Or, yeah, the standard deviation of stress distribution of a plate under load. And our method takes like 17 seconds. And for Monte Carlo, we are 18 minutes of three hours. The point is, when do you trust the Monte Carlo simulation when it does converge? So, depending on how strict you are on the convergence criterion, uh, this takes forever. These plots are quite interesting and also hard to see a bit because. What you have to check is the color. So our method is red and blue is the Monte Carlo simulation. Because what you see is not the deviation between the two uh, methods. It's basically the expectation value and the standard deviation. And actually standing here, it's even hard to see, but uh, the both curves are quite over another. And to go back to the example at the beginning, when you have a turbine blade, basically with our method on a, I guess it was on the laptop actually, yeah. it took 18 hours. Uh, 
And once upon a we did didn't do this or it runs somewhere, I don't know, it would take more than half of a year. So um I mean you can expect this when you have to do ten thousand times the same fan simulation for a, a, a this is a viscoelastic model, I guess. Viscoplastic. Viscoplastic. Viscoelastic, we also have this. So yeah. As I told you, ask them for if you have questions. <laughs> okay. Then a different topic, uh damage-based modeling. Actually, also uh at the moment we try to introduce also fatigue to it. And this is like the basic theory used for the most approaches we have. This is the Hamilton principle. Um, basically, yeah, this is you want to find the stationary condition of a functional. It's actually, if you just have this Gibbs energy, you end up with the principle of virtual work. So this is nothing special, but we also have like dissipation parts, hardening and constraints for the nonlinear material models we have. And of course, this you define all these quantities here to yeah, define your model, your material behavior. And of course, it can become quite complicated, so I don't go into detail here on the formulas. But instead, what we have to solve. So if you have this uh, functional, you derive the variation of calculus, you find your stationary conditions, and basically we will end up with like this three um, yeah, differential equations in the weak form, and we have to solve them basically. And what you could do is basically go and define like additional nodal unknowns for plasticity, it's not really necessary. You can solve it locally. But we, what we do is the damage variable, which basically tells you where in the body, when you load it, where it's weakened or damaged, basically, so loss of stiffness. We solve this separately from this problem. So this alone would be actually some more or less classic, um, classic plastic elastic material. We solve actually with ferrite. But this is like um, more or less an external algorithm to speed things up. So, okay, this is standing here on the slide. Um, yeah, there's two first equations we solve with the final element method with ferrite, basically. And the last one, we actually use the final difference scheme because this is faster. We also use an explicit time discretization. So it sounds at the first moment that it should take forever to converge, but uh, due to different factors, it's actually quite fast. But we have to uh, write this code completely by ourselves. And here's the, the flow chart. So we basically decouple the problem. We solve a standard finite element method, which can be nonlinear, in this case due to plasticity, in which the damage variable, so this D is constant actually. So you can more or less use a standard ferrite code. And after you did a load step update, you use the finite difference scheme to compute the new damage variable, and then you have to iterate it and um actually have to choose small time increments but anyways when you have brittle damage for example you yeah the most stuff is happening in a very short time so anyways you have a small time increment. so what we do is basically we jump between uh using ferrite for plastic elastic model then damage uptake go back and forth until we go through all the load steps and yeah this is the basic ferrite code so just to show you Actually, we do nothing special at this point. The only thing which is a bit special is that this damage variable here has to be somewhere in there. So it's not completely the basic um, plastic elastic model, but we have to introduce some additional variables, which are but for this Newton refs loop are constant actually. And the magic of the damage modeling is yeah, in an external algorithm. I don't show you any code here because it actually has nothing to do with finite elements, anyways. But what we do is actually we need from the finite elements the Helmholtz energy or the displacement fields or strains. So we need specific quantities from the finite elements to yeah, solve our PDE for the damage. And of course, some user inputs. And what we do is we need a lot of like yeah, mesh information. We also, for example, need the surface boundaries because we have a Neumann boundary condition in this PDE for the damage. And what we do is we um, compute the plus operator with the final differences. So we need the coordinates of the mesh and so on. And this is much easier to write in Julia and also get the data from ferrite than, for example, from ANSYS. We also got to run this stuff in ANSYS, but it's very cumbersome. So we are quite uh, happy to have ferrite and Julia. And, yeah. and then it loops and produces some results. For example, this double notch problem. So this is basically you pull it and what you see in red is not the crack, but the damaged zone. But with um, 
the right parameters, you it looks like cracks actually. And the difference on the right uh, hand side is oh, it starts again. The notches are just a bit closer to together, so the, the material parameters are not changed, but you can see different results and it runs parallel videos. Not oh, nice. Um, but yeah, this is like a damage result. The next step, or, or what we are now doing, is that you can also produce FADIC uh, results with this. So at this point, you would just increase the, uh, the displacements until you see the cracks. But what we do is we basically apply the load, and over time, you accumulate the load, load cycles. So each frame would be like after 100 loads, 200 load steps, 300, and so on. The damage picture would be probably the same. Maybe it stops depending on if it, you have a complete damage or not. Of course, this also works in 3D. Um, we printed also this result, but this is somewhat cheated because I printed the simulation result. So we, this is not the part and we tested it. Uh, we just took the deformed state and the damage and printed this one. So um, we don't have an experiment. This fits the results. We just printed the results. So <laughs> <laughs> quite interesting. Uh, the next thing is optimization. Actually, from a macro perspective, it's very similar to damage model I showed you, but just a little motivation with um, two, it doesn't start, I don't know. Yet. Ah. Um, those are two structures, or one structure, which is optimized for this particular load case. On the right-hand side is just a plate which has the same mass, same material. And you can see after like 9.5 kilograms, because I ran out of uh, weights basically, that this structure is not even visibly moving, but this plate is closed before breaking. Uh, I also have this printed here in a weaker material. Actually, those two are gone broken because when I have a, a conference, everyone's like pressing on the plate and someone is just broke. They didn't print it again. So basically, we start with the same as for the damage modeling. We have the Hamilton principle. We have different functionals, a lot of stuff here, but actually this is also within the ferrite JL. So it's like the last example at the moment. So this is due to the work of Misha actually. So he implemented everything. He also documented it. Uh, so basically check the homepage, then you will see the results. And just to shortly explain what's the idea behind this. So we have like internal variables like plasticity, for example, and the main variable we try to solve is now the sky. And what you do is basically you, if you have an optimization problem, you discretize the whole design space. So basically how large the part has to, uh, is allowed to be at the maximum. And this, what you solve for is this chi, which basically tells you in each point of the design space, there's material, there's no material. So in this case, the, the design space was some kind of rectangular and the boundary conditions is basically like, yeah, put it on a flat surface and try to press on at the top. And this is the result you can get from this equations basically. And the numerical solution is very similar to the damage modeling. So we can recycle a lot of the code snippets from the damage modeling. We have also this staggered approach where you solve the mechanical problem with the ferrite things and then do an update step. Instead of like a damage update, we update the design and then redo this in the loop over and over again until it's converted. And we do this for different materials. For example, elastic materials and isotropic on the left-hand side, in the middle, anisotropic. Also, we can add additional design variables, for example, here, the fiber direction. And the right-hand side, it also works for yeah, multiple materials. In this case, those are two materials which have different Young's model depending on tension and compression. So the boundary conditions are basically fixed at the bottom, and you have like in the load here. So the blue material is always on the tension, and the gray one is always on the compression. And then you depending on what kind of material you use, you always get different optimal topology. This also works for plasticity. So with additional internal variables, depending on what kind of hardening yeah, behavior you have, you also get different optimal results for the optimization. And what we're now going to do, so what's the next step, next step for us is to do optimization for hyperelastic materials. And yeah, with large deformations. And what's a bit of, big of, a bit of a problem is actually when you see at this or look at this optimization results, you usually get like fine trusses. And this is optimized for linear elastic material, but you see 
it will buckle basically. And to let the optimization yeah, prevent this buckling or tell the optimization that uh, this is bad, you have to like compute this buckling. And this is a bit of a complicated because the the void actually makes the most problems. So where the, there's no material, you basically have like, yeah, the material with stiffness go, tending to zero. And this is like a big problem when you try to like, uh, yeah, this tor tor the mesh at this point. And of course you always get snapback and snap through because like, when you have a truss work, you, yeah, you basically get this result. And you don't know actually in beforehand where your trusses are because you don't know the optimization result beforehand. So what we are now doing is we want to implement the arc length method. As I know, this is not done in ferrite, or not documented at least. And yeah, I hope you basically know everyone what about uh, what's about the arc length methods. This is basically when you try to follow this displacement force curve, you have to find a solution which is close to your um, yeah last load point. And there is this additional side constraint. So you actually don't know which what is the actual force you have to apply to find the elements. You solve this additional side equation. You can um, rewrite the equation system to make it much more efficient. But this is like things we want to implement or we want to uh, yeah have basically. And we've written down the pseudo code. We are right now implementing it, or at least one of the colleagues here. And yeah, this is like the code you can already find in, uh, in literature. This is something. Nothing new, actually, in theory, but for us in Ferrite, at least. And what we also find is um, yeah, a publication about, they call it like displacement controlled arc length method. Um, the idea is basically because, oh, I forgot to tell you what the, the final, um, yeah, what we actually want to do in the end is like soft robotics. So we want to optimize the kinematics of like this kinematic driven grippers, for example. The point is we don't want to like, prescribe the, the force at some point, we just want the arm to move in this position. So we want to prescribe displacement as boundary condition. And what the um, authors in this paper did basically is they split the displacement field in like three parts. So the usual one is the solution field you try to find, which is yeah, basic and finite elements. Also the prescribed um, displacement u star, which is your support or something like this. But what they also did is the displacements you prescribe as a load, they will be scaled with this lambda, basically like an arc length method where you would have here a force instead. So um, it sounds simple, but it completely changes the structure of the equation system you have to solve. And we don't have any idea how to get this in the DF handler. Maybe there's a simple solution, but we didn't come up with it uh, yeah, until today, basically. So this would be nice to have a discussion on how to implement this and also would be nice to know if someone is already trying to put in the classic arc length method would help us. So let me conclude what we are doing at our institute. So what we most do is, or the, the models we try to implement in ferrite are basically staggered models. So we have a finite element step or solution with some changes to the core, or we add some variables which are unusual. But we also like plug onto it a different solver, for example, to find a different scheme or the stochastic calculations. So we have to be really free at using our finite element approach and juggling with the data we get from the mesh, for example, or the whatever finite element uh, gives us. And where we now is to like basically make ferrite working for huge and large deformations, which are stable by for snapback, snap through because for optimization. I mean, the design space is usually like a block or something, but the problem is like you have a lot of void elements in there and you basically will ever get, uh, always get some process which will buckle. So we need a really like stable arc length method in this code. And the next thing is also, um, if you someone heard the term space time discretization, then we can talk about it, but uh, probably we will come up with this next year, the ferret comments uh, starting again and we will, Maybe have different problems then, I guess. So here's just the literature. If you're interested, we can talk about later. And with this, I'm yeah, complete my talk. Come to the questions. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah. 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 
So I have um, also implemented uh, a ArcMix over in my package. So uh, I can send you the code and you can have a look at it. This guy, I'm sorry, we're off. He's working on this. It will be nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit more about what you said. Were you struggling with the dot center? Maybe you can go back to that slide. Yes, Elias. You could also, Elias, you could also comment on how you enforce, uh, I guess, the Richelieu constraints in length method. Yes, you also did that, right? Uh, yeah, so I think I'm mostly done force control. Yeah, usually the, the, the idea is, oh. Okay, it's not written here in the slides. Easy. Yeah, the problem is when you do it force controlled, it's easy because you just have to recompute a residual vector. Yeah. And this actually changes your system matrix because you get an additional unknown which is coupled to the displacements. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry, then never mind, but can you add that? <laughs> I, I was just trying to understand this problem a little bit better. So, is your question about how to get in lambda to the system or how to apply the constraint? This feels a bit more like a problem of going through the, like doing a different type of constraint that depends on Lambda as well with your constraint handler. Ah, yeah, the problem is Lambda is an unknown to the, yeah. the equation system. So we actually need an additional global unknown, mm -hmm. but it actually depends also on how we, are. so we prescribe this, everything in blue is prescribed, so we, need the DOF handler to be told, okay, the displacement at this point is given, but multiplied with an unknown quantity. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to input this except by like hard coding the stiffness metrics or something. I can give a, maybe just a slight comment. There is started some time ago, some discussion on this to have like additional degrees of freedom that are non, not belonging to the mesh. So basically, but that's a bit outdated. There is an open, it's quite, it just, I think I need to add one field to the DOF handler back then. So the, I have some code that actually does that, but it's it's yeah. not really hard to do, but you cannot do it as far as I found without changing the DOF handler. Yeah. Because currently we cannot add in as a nice way, yeah. a degree of freedom that doesn't belong to a cell. Yeah. This is uh, but that's basically, if you do that, I think you can easily solve that. Okay, this is this is the one part, and the second one is we still want to prescribe some of the displacement. So we but, also have to like. Uh, but I mean, either it's constraint handler and tell them here we, at least the direction of this vector is given. So. Yeah, okay, but that's an affine constraint. If the direction, just the direction, that's the affine constraint between the components. Yeah. So you can combine that. That's no problem. Oh, okay. Um, but it's the additional degree of freedom I think is currently missing. Yeah. Um, but it's possible to it is okay. probably can be done soon if there's an interest. Okay, nice. <laughs> Do we have time for more questions? Yes, so, yeah, so yeah. Oh, no. yeah, sure. I also have a question which I was found interesting. You, when you talk about the buckling for the topology modernization, you briefly mentioned it, but I didn't quite get if you had a solution for the fact of, of like in the topology you need a residual stiffness otherwise it's non-solvable in the void area but even a slight residual stiffness will probably have a quite significant impact on the resistance to buckling do you have could you comment a bit how you plan to solve mm. or have solved that this is actually not that simple of an answer um we try different approaches <laughs> maybe the problem is how you model the void this mm -hmm. is solvable. So, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, the point we are now working is we basically, uh, the residual vector of those elements which are empty is zero, but we have um, diagonal stiffness metrics which are very uh, small scalar. So, mm -hmm. solver basically doesn't crash. Okay. You have to like see how this influences our result. And also, what you could think about later, especially for the soft robotics, is when uh, you have a structure which is self touching. Questions like if this void element in between should then have some basically infinite stiffness, so you have like a contact actually somewhere. Yeah, sure, contact you need. Well, first we have to run the arc length method and then we can go on. <laughs> okay, thanks. This, this is not an easy answer or easy topic actually.